also also share the questions. So please, Claudia and Michael. Thank you very much, Jasna. Thank you, Jasna. So let's get started. Um, we are your host, and uh, we want to say hello or hey. Buongiorno or bonjour. <laughs> And uh, as you heard from uh, the introduction of Jasma, we have given this presentation before at the IBC World Conference in um, New Orleans uh, in June. Uh, and we, Claudia and I, started talking about this topic uh, because we are both multilinguals. We speak uh, many languages and we use many languages yeah, both in our work sure. and in our private lives. And we realized that there are some common yeah. traits uh, that are worth thinking about for us as communicators uh, and we thought it would be uh, prudent to share some of our stories and also some of our insights and maybe what we'll try to do also give some advice to people who are either working with or are multilinguist or uh, speak more than one language. So let's get into it. Uh, this is the agenda for today. We're going to talk a bit how you become a multilingual. So we talk about ourselves. Uh, we're going to share some facts about multilingualism, and finally, uh, which is the meat, we're going to give you some advice uh, based on case studies that we've been working with as consultants and as communicators and marketeers, uh, having managed multilingual projects. So over to you, Claudia. Thank you, Michael, and good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to uh, talk about multilingualism again. It's really a passion that Michael and I share, and as he said, it's uh, it's been really uh, uh, fun to be able to uh, channel it into a professional project as well. So um, these are the five languages that I uh, that are part of my life. The first three, I use them actively. I'm Italian, uh, I live in France, and I work a lot in English. And then uh, also Dutch and Spanish are two languages that are part of my uh, of my daily uh, life. And so to uh, to tell you how we became multilingual, uh, I have to tell you a little bit the story of my life briefly. So as I mentioned, I am uh, an Italian national. I grew up monolingual until the age of 19. I grew up in Italy, in northern Italy. And then uh, since I was actually a professional volleyball player, I had been recruited by an American university after, college, after um, high school. And uh, that's when my second language came into, into the picture. I uh, attended college in the United States at Seton Hall University in New York um, and that's when I really learned English and uh, ended up living for 10 years in the States after Seton Hall I continued my studies at uh, Golden Gate University in San Francisco in communications advertising and PR so English really is my second language but it became um, sort of like a primary one at some point um, and then, you know, in San Francisco, I started my professional life. I uh, have the chance to have always worked in international settings and international companies. I started out with, uh, you know, the uh, French branch, the uh, U.S. branch of uh, Credit Agricole, which is one of the biggest French bran uh, banks. Um, I had a, a role in the uh, public relations department of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Arts, SFMOMA. And then I also had the chance to work with uh, um, one of the leading agencies in ethnic a global marketing called uh, now Global Works at the time it was uh, YR Communications which has been acquired. Um, they were uh, at the time really focused on leveraging um, you know budgets of the Fortune 500 companies and helping them target better the ethnic communities within the United States. So there was a lot of linguistic adaptations but especially cultural adaptation. And that's a little bit how I got, you know, started getting interested in uh, in uh, international communications as well. And then eventually I returned to Italy to join a startup in the late 90s called TV Files, which was one of the early um, solutions of IP content delivered via satellites. And that's how I tumbled and uh, across and I fell into the technology and the satellite world, which I uh, completely um, fell in love with. And, uh, and at some point uh, on those, that journey, I was recruited by uh, my current employer, which is Utilsat, one of the leading satellite operators, based in France. And so a uh, little over a decade ago, I moved to France, and I really had to learn French in order to, uh, to thrive and work and live here. Uh, and that's the third language so that, uh, that I got to learn um, in my life and that, that I get to use actively in my daily, uh, in my daily uh, both personal and professional life. 
Um, so today, you know, just a quick couple of things about, you know, what is my job like today. Um, I handle all the global market research and also customer experience projects for, for Utosat. Um, as I said, it's a, it's a small but very global company. We have a fleet of uh, about uh, 40 satellites, which cover 90% of, uh, of the population. We um, were headquartered in France, but we have offices in 19 countries and uh, with over a thousand collaborators of 37 nationalities. So both my daily exchanges internally and externally with our client base are uh, extremely international and, uh, and um, provide a lot of cross-cultural opportunities. We have clients from 80 countries and uh, we carry over 6,000 satellite uh, TV channels on our satellites and I do get to, I'm really lucky because I do uh, get to use actively my three languages uh, on a daily basis. There's always projects going on where it's, uh, you know, they require my linguistic skills. And this means, you know, either presenting at conferences, uh, at industry events, meeting with clients um, or devising global marketing strategies in order to leverage the market research and support our sales objectives. On the personal side as well, um, it doesn't get any more restful because I do need to keep on uh, juggling those languages plus the Dutch. Uh, Dutch or Netherlands is the native language of my husband who's a Flemish actually, he's a Belgian native and we have two boys and this is just a quick diagram, I'm going to ask Michael to, uh, to go through the, to the clicking but this just shows you how we, you know, how do we speak to each other at home and so I keep on speaking Italian to the kids and my husband speaks Dutch to them. We live in France, so they tend to reply or to use more actively French uh, during the day with us. And my husband and I speak English to each other because we met in English and so that remained our, our common language. And our kids among each other, they speak primarily Italian and French, but then they've also started to use English as well uh, because they've been exposed to it, you know, since their birth. And so that's also starting to become a little bit a family language. So as you can see, it gets um, it gets complex. It looks more complex. We we do understand each other, <laughs> but uh, to the uh, to the external ear, it can look a little bit chaotic. And at the same time, it provides a lot of richness. There's a lot of expressions that exist in one language, but not in another and so it's just uh, I find it personally extremely uh, intellectually stimulating the way we switch from one to another and the fact that we have all these options when we want to communicate with one another. And Michael back to you to tell your story. <laughs> well, yeah there was a few more <laughs> arrows here. <coughs> so yes as you were saying uh, you will also speak English uh, to each other. So thank you very much Claudia. Uh, these are my five, five languages. I'm born in Denmark, I live in Holland, I work in the UK, but also speak Swedish and German. Um, so this is my story. I grew up with multilingual parents who traveled a lot in the 50s and 60s. My mother worked both in Paris and Greenland. Uh, my father built a hotel in Italy for employees of large companies. So we traveled a lot and I was exposed to languages. And when I went to school, my mother wanted me to focus on languages. And in the 70s, uh, in Denmark, the main language was English, followed by German, French, and you had to have Latin as part of your curriculum. Swedish came by watching people on stopping on Swedish TV. Uh, there was no subtitles, and uh, you could only watch it uh, from Sweden in the beginning. Uh, so I learned Swedish by simply listening. Uh, I spent my summers in the UK. I stayed with British families as part of the EF program, uh, going to school every day, and then in the evening being part of a British family, uh, really immersing myself into the British language. I'm a communicator, I'm a facilitator trainer, and I mostly work in English and Dutch, and sometimes in Danish. My home is in Amsterdam, even though so currently I work in London. I'm married to an Italian. We speak Dutch at home, and one of my traits is I love different colored socks. <laughs> Fun thing about Amsterdam, one of the oldest capitals of Europe, uh, even though it's a smaller one, less than a million people, it actually has a large number of multinationals. And that means that there are people, and the last number I heard was 172 nationalities living in this wow. city. So uh, when you walk in the streets, you hear not only the tourists, but also the locals speaking very different languages. In my day job, I work as a principal uh, consultant for Fifth Business. 
uh, we most we mostly work in English and Dutch because that's where my clients are. Sometimes in Danish if I have clients in Denmark, and I focus on internet internal communications for large international clients, um, and they can be anything from oil and gas to manufacturing. Uh, and yes, I have been flying helicopters to go offshore to go to work working with wow. uh, people offshore. I use language and cultural awareness as an icebreaker or door opener. It, it helps understand people, it helps them tell them that I understand where they're coming from. But I often find the biggest challenge is working with dialects in different languages. So that's all about me. So let's go into some facts about what multilingualism really is. There are now 7,000 languages still spoken in the world. There were more once, but there are 7,000 languages. And these have all in common that they are, they are countries with two or more official languages. So Canada, of course, you have English and French. Uh, Belgium, where Claudia's husband is from, have actually three languages because they have Flemish, yeah. they have French, and they also have German. And then the same goes from Luxembourg. Switzerland, four languages. Spain, with a number of uh, local uh, languages as well. So a lot of languages, a lot of countries have more than one language. And I think for a lot of people working in the US, UK, or other uh, Anglo uh, countries, this is something they're not aware of. And uh, it does create cultural barriers from time to time. So Claudia, over to you, because you, you did some study on this. Uh, well, this was just, you know, part of our way to uh, keep on illustrating that there's, uh, you know, in, when we look at the United States, for instance, we have a tendency of considering it a, a, a homogenic and, uh, and a one-country type of uh, type of environment. But actually, there are several languages spoken uh, there as well, and Spanish being the most spoken, but also several. Um, Asian languages, there's huge communities, and this also goes back to my experience with the uh, ethnic uh, advertising agencies. I do remember that at the time, you know, being so surprised learning facts like the biggest Brazilian community outside of Brazil is actually in Boston. You know, could you believe that? It's a, it's a, it's a very multicultural society, of course. So there's several, multilingualism is a reality in the United States as well. And let's move to Europe. So this is a list of all the European countries, and as you can see, Luxembourg at the top, where two-thirds of the working age, so adults, speaking more than their own language. Uh, so 99% of people in Luxembourg actually speak more than one language every day or work in more than one language every day. Quite an impressive list. Absolutely, with the average in the in Europe being in any case 66%. So we do have, um, and then you know we have seen also with Schengen and the mobility, the increased mobility within Europe, um, we're seeing this trend just becoming more and more uh, stronger every day. VMS um, published a survey earlier this year. So Claudia, over to you. Um, yes, VMA, which is a uh, very large consulting and recruitment group uh, with, with bases a little bit all over the world, they've been uh, leveraging their uh, international presence to really uh, start doing, you know, polling on a regular basis. And in 2016, they had a very interesting report, which I think it's accessible on the website, uh, on internal communications professionals. And one, there was one item that actually was you, Michael, that brought to our attention, um, was that they were able to assess that 9 out of 10 in Internal communications professionals in Europe uh, speak more than one language. So, uh, actually, speak more than two languages. Um, so, again, this goes also to corroborate and to show how also within our individual industries, you know, and when we or more than industry, like in the in the horizontal roles uh, that we play in our the, you know respective organizations, um, multilingualism is something that is uh, more uh, of a daily reality. Exactly. Okay, so we're going to talk a little about how we learn uh, to speak languages. Claudia. Yes, uh, well, you know, when do we learn how to speak? Well, normally, kids, in, on average, and across different cultures, they it's around one year of age that they start uttering the first words, right? Um, so we expect them to, we think that they're, they, they, they use that first year of word, uh, the, the first year of life to, um, you know, to learn how to speak. But how do we really learn how to speak? Uh, well, it's mainly done by mimicking, by mimicking our caregivers. Um, so that first year, it's really important 
important because they observe and they, they really watch how we move our lips, the expressions, the tones. It's really about mimicking all of that and that's how you know kids learn their maternal language. But something that perhaps not everybody knows is that the process actually starts much earlier than that. Um, the fetus, when it's in the VAMP actually, already at between six and seven months completes the auditive system. So hears perfectly well. Um, you know, a lot of the sounds, and especially when the mother speaks, uh, of course the sounds are a little bit muffled by the amniotic liquid, but, uh, but uh, it can really sense, especially when the mother is talking, it can sense the tone, the voice, um, the, uh, you know, the intonations, and, um, and it can really sense, especially when the mother is speaking different languages. So that's something that I was really uh, investigating when I was pregnant, because I was speaking daily my three languages and, and, and wondering how my kids are going to, you know, be influenced by this. So there's, it's proven there's a lot of research today that shows that multilingual parents, obviously, um, just by the fact of speaking different languages, are, are you know, making kids that are more prone later on to, uh, to, uh, to be learning other languages. And in any case, it's, it's as if they're being seeded for, for speaking other languages as well. And then, you know, something else which research today can can prove very clearly is that there's uh, significant differences between the monolingual brain and the multilingual brain, simply because the, the bilingual or multilingual people, they use uh, actively different types and uh, different parts of the brain when using different languages. Information is stored in different parts and synapses are done in a different way. What does this mean? This means that, you know, it has um, you know, concrete impacts as well, which are being measured uh, more and more frequently into our daily lives. It, um, it uh, provides, for instance, multilingual people often, they are said to have different personalities depending upon the languages that they that they speak. Um, and that's also something, you know, Michael, you and I, we talked often about this and we certainly relate to this. You know, we have um, different personas depending upon, you know, which language we're using and what does that language represent also. Is it my maternal language? Is the language of the affection that I, that I have been raised with? Or is it my, you know, in my case, for instance, English has been really an adult language linked to academics and business, um, so uh, so there's uh, there's strong uh, links in that sense. Exactly. Yep. Okay. And then, so uh, how do we learn them? And That's also, what yes, Claudia was there, talking there, about. Exactly. So there's there's differences also in learning a language as a toddler and a foreign language, you know, when we speak about foreign languages, or when we learn them as an adult. In my case, for instance, I learned all my foreign languages, you know, after the age of 20. And it's perfectly doable, you know, we can, you know, the human brain is extremely powerful, we can keep on learning languages all our life. However, there is now a very um, precise window of opportunity between zero to six months first, of life and then also between zero and six years as well. It's a second window of opportunities. So kids that are exposed to foreign languages in that period of time, they are more likely to be fluent uh, multilinguals later on. And, be, and that's because the you know the brain is different, is much more uh, flexible, much more powerful. Um, and also there's other elements, you know, as an adult, we have different brain repositories for this type of, uh, this type of um, you know, things. And then also we're more self-conscious, for instance. Between zero and six years, kids, they take everything as challenge, as a game. So they're not worried about making mistakes, mispronouncing, but they take a foreign language as a code to crack. Well, we're adults, we're a little bit more self-conscious. Do I sound stupid? And, you know, do I make sense or not? And finally, there's also um, a strong difference in terms of the, uh, the output, you know, and the, and the way we sound. When kids learn foreign languages, their muscles in the throat and in the mouth, they're still extremely flexible, so they're able to reproduce sound correctly. While as an adult, we, our muscles are formed and are, and are, and are aligned you know, along our native language, and so that's why we tend to have accents. And um, I know I have an accent in English, I have an accent in France, because my languages have been learned later on. Yeah, and I think what's also interesting when it comes to learning languages as, a, as an adult is actually proven that we can offset Alzheimer's if we keep on learning new things yes. and also learning new languages. 
a friend of mine who is in his 60s and has retired has decided to learn Sanskrit and uh, not because we're going to use Sanskrit for anything but reading Sanskrit but still it's a way of keeping the mind busy and therefore thereby offsetting the opportunity or the possibility of Alzheimer's. You're absolutely right, and uh, and that's why we, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's what we were saying before that the different brains repositories and the different parts of the brains that are solicited by speaking different languages, it's now proven that they can delay uh, senility and uh, Alzheimer's disease by as much as five years, for instance. Yeah. So you know, what are the the, the success factors uh, when when we lead a multilingual life or when we want to learn a new languages? You know, what are the things that are you know that are going to make it easier or harder? Um, and there's a there's a great book called uh, Raising Multilingual Children, which I strongly you know rep uh, recommend even if you're not raising multilingual children, but just also for general knowledge and if you're interested in multilingualism, uh, it's an extremely interesting book. And so they really uh, you know based on scientific research, they really manage to um, to identify some of these, you know, ten factors, and I'm not going to go through them all of them. Some are are pretty self-explanatory, but there's, you know, we talked about the timing. You know, there's some windows of opportunities. The, the earlier you start, the easier it is. Simply, simply, um, there's an element of aptitude. You know, there are some people that have that gene. They're little. They're just, you know, more prone to learning languages. Just like some of us are a little bit more prone to learning math or or, or other sciences. Um, there's an element of motivation as well. You know, how strongly motivated are to learn French, you know, to learn to, <laughs> to learn languages, and uh, I was uh, I had a Freudian slip, and I was almost saying France because I know that when I when I moved here, I was strongly motivated to learn French. Otherwise, I would have not been able to survive. Um, there's elements of strategy and consistency. You know, the opportunities of being exposed to another language. Are you being supported? You know, what is the environmental exposures, and also the relationships between your native language and the languages that you're learning. You know, Italian and French for me are extremely close. So. It wasn't that hard. And um, for me, it's it, learning Dutch has been easy because I speak English and German and Danish, and uh, and Dutch is very related as a low Germanic language to these languages. So it has been easier for probably easier for me as a Dane than for other people who migrate to Holland and try to learn Dutch. Exactly, exactly. Um, there's also some other softer but interesting elements that do play a role. Apparently, there's a, the, you know the rank within the siblings you know can can impact. And I see it, for instance, within my you know with my children. My firstborn had no problem you know growing up with all the four languages around the house. And for him, it was very clear who spoke what. Uh, his younger brother um, also developed you know pretty seamless uh, multilingualism, but it was a little bit of a rougher start because he also had the little brother that spoke all those languages and so he was a little bit more confused. Um, there's also some clear research that shows that there's one gender which is slightly more prone to languages than the other and I will not mention it but I'm pretty sure that everybody knows which one it is and also the fact of being left, left or right-handed can have an impact as well. So fascinating um, elements that research today is able to, uh, to highlight. Okay, thank you Claudia. So um... Let's see if I can move it on. Yeah, so we're going to give you some advice and we're going to build it on some of the cases that Claudia and I have been involved in. And the first one is to be fluent. So it's important to cultivate fluency. Um, I was asked to lead a multinational team in a large energy company and the project team uh, was working on a SharePoint migration and as project manager I was working with two British, two Dutch and one Caribbean uh, person on the team. We had English as a common language and when I came in I felt that there were some things misunderstood, the communications wasn't going so well um, and I realized that especially between the British, Caribbean and the Dutch there were some barriers. So I ended up having individual meetings with everyone and in those meetings I used their own language. And not only did it build me up as their team leader, they, they respected me, but it also ended up because we, we realized we needed to respect each other through the language and through the cultural differences, we actually built, ended up being a very strong, cohesive team and we, uh, we did the project uh, on, on time and budget. The other one we're going to talk about is having cultural sensitivity. And this is not just Google translating or translating. I call this from Finland to Poland. I was asked to help on a SAP migration project uh, for a large cement company 
and the first country that went live was Finland and they sent me to this remote Finnish cement uh, factory uh, in the middle of winter and if anyone has been to Finland in the middle of winter you know what it can be like um, there was an Irish British team coming in uh, and we were working with the locals in their languages while I was there I got to meet the different people working on the team and also the local uh, managing director in uh, Finland and it turned out that he was Polish and suddenly I remembered from the plan that the next country we would be going into was Poland and I realized that maybe it would be a good to have a video message from him in Polish to his Polish colleagues talking about why we were doing this sub-migration and it actually helped us being very successful in the migration in Poland. Very interesting, very interesting. Thanks Michael. Uh, you always have very uh, uh, global and interesting cases uh, to share. Uh, my my example comes from one of the projects that I worked on when I was uh, working with YR back in the States on on uh, multicultural communications and and um, and adaptation, and so we had this client Allstate, which is a huge um, insurance company uh, in the United States, and as you can see, their main logo is the two hands cup like this, and then usually they have for each individual vertical they would put into the two hands you know the icon of the elements that they're selling, whether it's life insurance would be the typical American family with the father, the mother, a daughter, and a, and a, and a son. Or if it's uh, the home insurance, they would put um, you know, the little outline of the typical American suburban house. So they wanted, they came to us because they uh, had tried to enter the Chinese markets and for some reason they were not going anywhere. They couldn't open any, any franchise, they couldn't sell. And so they sensed, you know, perhaps there's some cultural elements that are, are creating some barriers. And indeed, you know, we did some research and we, we, we were, you know, pretty quick in assessing that it was a lot of it had to do with just with their collateral, with their branding that was completely um, unrealistic for a Chinese market where for life insurance, you know, for, for first of all, uh, as you know, in China, there was these policies where families can only have one kid. So coming with a logo that shows families with two kids was just completely inappropriate and, and and, and uh, people could not relate to that. And also in terms of the, the uh, home insurance, um, you know, their housing logo uh, was not resonating with the, with the Chinese audiences because most of the people, especially in urban areas, they tend to live in apartments or apartment buildings. So we help them just with simple, you know, just to show you how simple elements like this can be just like a symbol, a logo, or, or, or a color, you know, it's a lot of it, a lot of elements can have strong um, cultural elements and connotations that have a real impact impact on business. So, um, you know, they ended up, uh, thanks to the, the collateral that we were able to align for them, uh, really enter the Chinese market and develop strong business lines over there. The second example um, is also how sometimes, um, you know, sound as well, you know, the way things and brands and names sound in another language can have an impact as well. And this is another funny example of an IP telephony company uh, from England called Skyfo which stands for Sky Phone. Um, at some point, you know, in the early 2000s, they wanted to enter the Italian market. And Skyfo, as you see, it's written like this. It's read in Italian, schifo. And what happens is that, you know, what they meant, they were, they were trying to convey, I guess, with their brain, you know, sky phone, like conveying something coming from the sky and, you know, a new, a new form of telephony. But schifo, what it sound, you know, what, 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 it, what it means in Italian, it's actually a word and it means disgust. So you can imagine how they really never went anywhere and they, they, they had to uh, pack up soon and, and uh, try to enter other markets as well. So something very, as innocent as your branding might not be translating well in other markets and you need to really conduct tests and make sure that uh, you know, it doesn't convey negative connotations. I lost the audio. Mute. Uh, the other thing you have to be aware of when you are working with different uh, cultures and different languages is the stereotypes, the colloquialism, and the human nuances. So we all recognize where these people are from, uh, but of course we shouldn't be using them in our communication or in our marketing. Uh, even some, I'm sure some yeah. some brands will do because they want to uh, tell people very quickly uh, this is about Italy, France, or uh, Scandinavia with the Vikings. 
And, and if I can just add to that, you know, why, I don't know if everybody is aware, but like, you know, why do we have stereotypes? You know, why do we build them? It's because the brain, you know, needs to process information daily on a massive scale. And in order to make sense of reality, like we knew, do need to classify the way the brain works, you know, we need to classify information. So sometimes cultural traits, they are classified in what becomes stereotypes. It's just because it makes it easier for us to process things and process information um, but as Michael said you know we, we as communicators need to be absolutely aware of that and making sure that it's not uh, exploited in the wrong way or it's not you know being perceived as offensive so these are some examples of British language that we hear as uh, non brits and unless you know them they can be difficult to understand and it's the same uh, when you have certain expressions in different languages they, you can't always translate them uh, from uh, one language to another and they may even uh, not exist so you have to be aware uh, of the cultural and also of the language differences so uh, my example is when you are too close for comfort you're actually sitting on each other's laps you know you're wearing each other's laps down and your example is uh, if you have a big issue, you're actually going to skin a female cat, not even <laughs> just a cat, but a female cat. <laughs> Fe female, ca female cats in Italy are very problematic. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right, moving on. Also acronyms. So this is an example uh, of when you go from one language to another that not all words translate into the same. The French, uh, who wanted a different language when AIDS came out in the 1980s, decided to use the uh, acronym SIDA, uh, but SIDA is also the Swedish International Environment Agency, so you can imagine if you were using the word SIDA in Sweden, uh, everyone would have the connotation to the International Environment Agency and not necessarily to AIDS. Uh, so be aware when you use acronyms uh, and going into different uh, languages and markets. Yeah, different markets. And the last one is to reach out to experts and always test. Yes, and I have, you know, this is something that we do a lot, you know, in my daily, uh, in my daily uh, role. I uh, just wanted to kind of, you know, share with you a little bit something that I live on a daily basis. There's a one specific project, um, which is our Utosa TV Observatory. It's an annual research market that we do in 51 markets to assess how, people, how consumers receive television. Um, it's done in Europe, it's done in the Middle East, uh, and we, you know, leverage a lot this research. It's not just for, done for internal intelligence, but we leverage it a lot also for external communications purposes and business development. So we go into individual markets, we localize it, um, we tend to do uh, a deployment offline and online and it's you know translated de facto in three languages but then also localized it in more than that. Um, and that's where my linguistic skills really they support the quality check and also allow me, just like Michael also mentioned in his own project, you know, they, they allow also the personal um, development relationships, you know, strong ties with the with the local teams as well. Uh, whether it's colleagues or, or clients or sometimes also like the press. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit how you know it impacts my uh, my daily job. Exactly. And then we have we have well, one last example. I just want to mention, yeah, I just want to mention an example that uh, we did a, my company, we did a online uh, training for 20 languages and it's important that you have local people checking not only the, the translation but also making sure that we're hitting the right words and not using acronyms that we, sh we shouldn't be using in that language. Exactly. And then we have one last example um, that, you know, really uh, made us think this year. It was about one year ago, actually. It was in October 2015. In one, um, one of those uh, uh, investors and uh, venture capital tech conferences in San Francisco, uh, a journalist uh, came up with a neologism, which we found very curious. So they were talking about incubators and they were talking about about accelerators and they were thinking okay you know we got there's there's now a new form of VC and it's actually something in between the two and they decided to call it an inculator now um, what they, you know, so you see now on the left hand side, you know, the articles that started coming out uh, on the uh, uh, primarily California, uh, then national technology press so that started, you know, talking about this, you know, what's an inculator and what makes one successful. Um, 
what they didn't understand is that you know digital audiences today are global by definition so it's not that something that is relevant in California um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have an impact on the other side of the globe uh, because news now travel fast everybody has access to this type of information and especially the press um, so when you come up with a new word you have an interest to 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 perhaps you know find out and test you know how does it sound like in other languages that does it not have any other connotation because something you know a word like inculator in Latin languages so in French Italian and Spanish is a strong uh, sexual connotations of sodomy. So you can imagine, and you see on the right hand side, you know, an article that came up a couple of months later from Wired Italy, where they were just, you know, cracking up laughing about this because they were saying, okay, we're already as a startup, or you're already, life is just, it's already hard uh, as it is. And uh, now they come up also with the inculator. It, it's just hilarious. It lends itself for like a complete wrong image. That's not at all what they were trying to convey in, uh, in San Francisco. But uh, it really made me think as, um, as, um, how you know the fact that uh, again what really what this really proves is the fact that you know especially when you're going out digitally with the, you know any type of content the audiences are global by definition so you do need to uh, you know make sure that uh, your content is not offensive or it doesn't have another meeting or it cannot be uh, misunderstood and uh, and how do you do that but there's experts there's uh, there's people that you know speak the languages uh, in this case the journalist perhaps should have uh, since he was inventing a world they should have you know taken the time to convey and, and, and check with uh, some of his colleagues uh, on international newsrooms um, uh, but there's also companies and agencies that are there you know to uh, uh, to, uh, to support you in this type of uh, in this type of exercise if needed so on one hand there's the linguistic competence and on the other hand there's also you know professionally it's a world business also that is out there Exactly. And we want to end by using this Czech proverb saying those who know many languages live as many lives as the languages they know. Uh, I definitely feel that the languages I've learned have enriched my life uh, and I do encourage everyone to learn as many languages as they can and need uh, because it does enrich you culturally but also creating friendships uh, around the world uh, so you can enhance your professional and your private network. Deep so we have come to the end. Um, we are going to go over to uh, questions and uh, see if we can answer them. Uh, so over to you, Claude, uh, to Jasna. <laughs> Thank you. Well, so far they, uh, there haven't been any questions, but I wanted to mention that we have a five-year-old um, listening. Uh, <laughs> Natasha tweeted uh, <laughs> during, during the webinar that her five-year-old uh, daughter is is uh, listening, so um, you have mm. to start young, <laughs> like I said. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions, um, you can either put them in chat or, or um, in the questions pane. Yasna, I have a question for you. You are also a multilingual professional, and how do you see that um, enriching or impacting your work? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, well, mostly I do use uh, either Slovenian, I, I come from Slovenia, um, and uh, English, uh, and my other languages are worse. <laughs> I'm not that good at them, but uh, still I sometimes lecture in Croatian and Serbian, and um, it definitely, uh, like you said, it, it's not just learning the language, it's really knowing the culture, it's really um, uh, having an opportunity to um, get connected quicker and um, I actually think that this is one of the the reasons uh, why I also joined IABC to have that network of uh, different uh, nationalities and uh, multilingualism around me. Mm -hmm. it, I find okay, it, so that we it really... Question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so the question is from uh, Luis Fernandez. Uh, what are your tips on language best practices when recognizing people as cultural difference might have a completely different impact? So you can see it also in it's a little long. You can see it in, in the questions pane. So, what are your tips on language best practices when recognizing people as cultural difference might have a completely different impact? Michael, you wanna? We don't hear you, Michael. Unmute, please. 
Yes. I think it's what I said before, that when you are working uh, with a project that is aimed to reach people uh, with different languages and probably maybe even with different cultures, uh, that using local professionals to have it checked uh, to ensure that you're hitting not only the right tone, not the right language, but also ensuring uh, that acronyms get corrected, that you're not saying something that could be misunderstood, like sports expressions or uh, other things where some people will feel lost. And I can tell you right now that I'm working on a global project uh, and I've been asked by my colleague in Trinidad if I can show her what we're going to uh, work on before we produce it so that she can ensure that the people in Trinidad also feel included uh, when we uh, start rolling out. And I think that's very important that people need to feel included. Uh, if they, if you're communicating to a global audience, uh, you need to, like just the, the hands we're showing here, there needs to be hands of different nationalities, of different colors, of men and women, of young and old. So you need to have those as the same as with the languages. Any other questions? I can ask you if you're planning to learn another language. <laughs> uh, yes, I am. Uh, I still have it on my list. I need to learn. I need to be better at Italian. I understand Italian, but I'm not comfortable speaking it yet. Um, I have a very big passive uh, vocabulary, uh, but putting it into sentences, I need to have a week with someone who only speaks Italian, and then it will probably come uh, come out. Yes, and and same for me. I uh, I uh, you know ashamed to uh, to admit that you know Dutch is definitely not you know very up there in level of fluency yet. I hear it uh, every day. It's the language of uh, my husband and my and my two children as well. It's their third language, um, and uh, you know I can get by with like basic conversations, but it's uh, it's definitely a goal to uh, get better at it uh, at some point. And also Russian, actually. I studied it in college. I took two years of Russian and I loved it. I love the culture. Uh, so it's something that I really would like to pick up again at some point. Great. So uh, in a year or two, we can uh, do the updated version. <laughs> <laughs> so before we leave, we have another question uh, from Alba Perez Grandi. Uh, English is the business language used in the corporate environment. What languages come after and useful for business communicators? What do you think? Oh, that's a very interesting question. It is, it is, yeah, English has become the lingua franca, but as we have also illustrated, you know, um, sometimes there's a lot of miscommunication can happen because you're not, we're all not native English speakers, so um, that's that's really quite interesting. As, as far as, like, you know, what is the next uh, second best language in terms of universal speakers and in terms of business opportunities, it really depends upon where, you know, of the individual industries and individual, uh, the individual, uh, you know, regional activities. Um, I think the second most spoken is Spanish in the world. Um, for us, you know, in, in, in our line of work in the in the satellite industry and in television, you know, we're seeing tremendous growth in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance. So we, uh, you know, we have a lot of um, new channels coming with different languages, uh, you know, from those countries. Um, Arab as well is a very important language, which we're starting to integrate slowly in our marketing because we we were the first orbital position received in uh, in all North North Africa and in the Gulf. Um, but it's really you know pertaining to our own particular industry so it really depends upon what uh, you know which vertical you're active in Michael I don't I, know what you want to say no, something I, about it. I agree but I also see a change I see that uh, companies yes they use English as their primary business language but they also translate um, and translation has become much easier uh, with translation software that recognize the, the words and now also the phrases. They still need a human eye and a human touch, uh, but there are translation software out there that actually helps create websites, uh, create newsletters, etc. In, in different languages. Uh, I saw a really good example of the uh, KLM uh, client newsletter that goes out in two languages, so you click on your own version whether you want Dutch or you want English. Uh, and this is something that more and more companies are using because, as Claudia said, uh, we may here in Western Europe have a good working uh, English language, but not everyone has that. And if also, if you want to make sure people really understand it, if it's like a key message on safety, on processes, you may have to translate into local languages. And I see it in my own 
uh, client base in the uh, the big manufacturing in oil and gas that they translate to Spanish, to Chinese, to Arab, uh, because they want to ensure that people really get the message. Absolutely. I see, uh, you know, just uh, very soft informal research, you know, in, in my in my sphere from friends all over the world. I see an increase of um, uh, learning of Chinese in younger kids. You know, there's a lot of schools uh, here in France, but also like you know, I hear it in the states. I hear it in Asia as well. You know, there's a lot of schools uh, um, proposing more and more Chinese as well to to young kids already in middle school. I don't know if that's going to be a trend at some point uh, or not. I think it will be, and I, I, I think Arab and Chinese are the, the two upcoming languages that we'll see more and more children choosing, uh, but also that we'll see more and more, more uh, companies choosing. Okay, thank you. What I wanted to share with you is also... Um, uh, Eurocom 2017. I'm not sure if you see the screen because my turned yes. out black at this point. Okay, at least you see it. I don't see it anymore. Uh, so there. we have Eurocom, um, which is uh, our main IBC uh, EMEA conference, and we have it this year, next next year actually, in London at the end of March. Uh, so 28th to 29th of March. And I would like to invite you, you see on the screen um, the bit.ly, uh, you know, the URL where you can check uh, what we are preparing. And don't forget, you have an early bird rate until December 31st. So 16 more, no, less, <laughs> yeah, a little bit like that, 16 more days. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to be fantastic. We're planning um, a, really, a really good conference and everybody who also attended uh, previous year. Excellent. Look forward to it. You, you probably know what you, Claudia and, and Michael, thank you so much for um, giving us this uh, wonderful Hi, webinar. Um, and for everybody else, stay tuned. We have something very good also prepared for January, and we will keep you posted on the emails that you provide. Thank you. Thank you, ver thank you very much, Jasna, for all the wonderful uh, hosting. Oh, you're welcome. This is bye from me, from Ljubljana, and um, saying bye to, I think, Paris and London. Yes, bye yes. from London. <laughs> bye bye, au revoir. Bye, everybody. Adio. Au revoir. Adio. <laughs>